We are in Acts chapter 12, if you will. So if you'll open there, we'll get right into our Bible study tonight. And uh, Acts chapter 12. If you remember back in Acts chapter 11, uh, there were, uh, well, let's just go back there just real quick. Um, The church is responding to a need in uh, Judah, and uh, they decided to send Paul and Barnabas, or Saul and Barnabas, the last verse, chapter, verse, chapter 11, verse 30. They send them, uh, the, uh, the collection they've made, they send that with them to take it to the church in uh, Jerusalem and uh, to take care of those needs that are there in Judea. And now we get to verse 12, and we're back to Peter again. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Let's talk for just a second. Herod here is not the Herod that was the Herod at the time of Christ's birth. He is the grandson of that Herod. He carries on the same kind of rule that his, great, his grandfather did. And uh, his grandfather, of course, killed the babies trying to destroy Jesus. Now we have this king, a grandson that wants to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. And so uh, he stretched out his hand to vex certain of the church. He's, he's got a list. He's got a blacklist. He's got a list of men that he wants to try to stop. And, of course, one of those would be uh, one of the leaders. Uh, these are the apostles. And one of those is James. And remember, James is one of the inner circle. Peter, James, and John. That's the James we're talking about. John's brother, uh, James. And uh, so he was close to Jesus. And this is who he chooses. And he brings him in and, mar and, and martyrs. He kills him with the sword. And he's the, he's the, although Stephen was the first martyr of the church, James is the first martyred apostle of the church. And so we find here that uh, this is, uh, and notice this, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, it pleased them that he had killed James. Now then, he, he then decides, you know, that's good. I'm winning favor, so let's go after another. And so who does he go? So he proceeds further. Typical politician, amen? If it works and I can get some credibility with some of my voters, then I will do that. Of course, they weren't voting for him then, but the, the, his constituents, and they, they want to do that. So what does he do? He takes Peter. Boy, I tell you what, he goes after the top three, doesn't he? Peter, James, and John. I think John would have probably been next. But Peter also. Then were the days of the unleavened bread. The only thing is there was a problem because now they'd entered into a special time for the Jews, the time for the preparation for the Passover. And so uh, it wasn't a good time for killing uh, Jews because Peter was Jewish uh, and it wouldn't have set well with the Jews. So he puts him in jail. Um, and he says, uh, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison. And delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him. Now, I want to, you talk about overkill. This is overkill. One little preacher. Amen. Of course, Peter, he was probably a little wiry. And he'd already been captured once. Remember? Uh, he and John. And uh, what happened was, is the angel came and told them, said, get back down there to the temple and go to preaching again. And they did just exactly what the angel told them to do. So they've already had to deal with him escaping from prison already. So he gives them to four quaternions. Now you can almost figure out what that is. A quaternion would be how many soldiers? Four. Yeah. So he's got four and he's got four of the four. So he's got 16 soldiers that are going to guard him from 24-7. Two will be chained to him. And two will be in the cell room to guard the door and to protect, make sure he doesn't escape. It's a pretty secure situation if you realize it. And so this is where they're at. And this is what's going on. Uh, uh, what have I got? Uh, 
Now then, he says, uh, intending after Easter, the King James reads, that's actually Passover that he's talking about, to bring him forth to the people. So after Passover, after we get past the religious holiday, then we'll take him out and kill him, you know? That's pretty the way they did things, right? I mean, it's like Jesus, you know? Let's wait till the right time. We'll do it, you know, we'll wait till this and then we'll do it then. And, you know, all the stuff they did in trying to find the right time to kill Jesus as Jewish leaders. And uh, this was the case here uh, as Peter is waiting now in prison. Let me tell you something. God's power can never be contested. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad you serve a God that's so big, so powerful, that, that nothing can uh, go against him? Uh, he has the power to do anything and everything that he desires to do. And he's God, which makes him sovereign, which makes everything that he chooses to do right. And so, I mean, you're talking about the most, the most powerful uh, entity that there is, which is God. He's all powerful, according to what we read out of the Old Testament. He's El Elyon. He's almighty. And so we know that this God, and uh, no matter what they may do, no matter how many quaterion of the soldiers they put around him, if God wants Peter released, he's going to be released. What's interesting is God has given Peter um, kind of a pass because he's told him how he'll die. Remember back when Peter questioned him about it? And he told him how he would die. He's going to be carried out. He, uh, they'll actually hang him upside down and the Lord gave him how he would die but he was going to have a good long life as far as as far as apostles go and uh, so I, I'm not sure Peter was real concerned about what was going on here now you or I might have been but Peter has learned to walk by faith and watch what happens it says Peter therefore was kept in prison but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him I'm going to tell you there's the power of prayer. I'm going to tell you, we need prayer. Amen. We have lost the power of prayer in America and in the churches. Prayer is so vital. And it's probably one of the least used tools that God's given a Christian. We fail to recognize the importance of prayer. We ought to pray about everything. And I'm just as guilty. I'm preaching to me just like I'm preaching to you. We ought to be constantly aware of the need for prayer. Somebody says, man, I'm having a struggle. Let's pray about it. We don't even have to know what the struggle is. Let's just pray about it. Uh, pray for your church. Pray for your pastor. Pray for those in leadership. There's plenty to pray for, amen? If, you're, if you don't have a long enough prayer list, don't worry. We can add to it, amen? We've got a long one, but listen, there's plenty to be praying for. And we ought to be praying for these people. And here is a church that understood the power of prayer. I was sharing today with my, bro my son, my brother, my son, he's my brother in Christ, my son, and I think I've shared it with you. I've told you about the furnace at uh, Spurgeon's Tabernacle. I know you'll remember the story when I tell you. Three young men loved, wanted to go hear Dr. Spurgeon preach and uh, they, they got everything together and they went to the great Spurgeon's Tabernacle to hear him preach. And when they got there, it was packed and the doors had been closed and they couldn't get in. And the maintenance man had me standing outside the door and said, did you come to hear Dr. Spurgeon preach? And they said, yes, but we came too late. He said, well, he said, uh, instead of just standing here, would you like for me to show you some of the build of the tabernacle? I'll show you where the furnace room is. And they kind of looked at each other and thought, furnace room? I guess so. So he takes them down the side of the building, downstairs and underneath where Dr. Spurgeon is preaching. And they enter into a large room and there's 700 men praying for Dr. Spurgeon as he preaches. I'm going to tell you what. You have men praying for you when you preach. You have women praying for you when you preach. You're going to have power when you preach. I love what... Somebody, I think in here, uh, you know, if you, you or I've heard it say on Facebook, you know, if you've got a problem with your preacher, his ability to preach or his fire in this pulpit or whatever, you know what? It'd help him a lot if you just pray for him. Amen. Just pray for him. And um, I think it's important for prayer. We need prayer. These people that are in our place, we, they need our prayers and we ought to pray. Well, Peter is in need of prayer. The greatest tool in the Christian's arsenal is prayer. And these people are going to pray. 
He was kept in prison, but prayer. Like there, look, look, look. There's that word. You see it? Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But, but, boy, I love those buts in the Bible, man. I'm telling you what, there's that but, there's that golly but. But something else is taking place that's more powerful than him being in prison, and that is the prayer. And notice this, it's made without ceasing. That is fervent prayer. In fact, the uh, the Greek that's used there means uh, uh, stretched to the limit. That's the kind of prayer they were praying. It was prayer that was stretched to the limit. They were praying as much as they could, as hard as they could. They were praying in, in intercess, inter, intercessory prayer for Peter at that moment, fervently praying. And who was it praying? Of the church. There we see it's not just private prayer. Private prayer is important. We need private prayer. But this is corporate prayer. This is the church coming together for a prayer meeting for one thing. And that's the release of Peter. Peter's protection. And they prayed unto God for him. Verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping. He's facing execution. And yet he slept. The Lord had told him that he would die in an old age. And the last time in prison, the angel came and released him. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Peter says, Cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I think Peter understood that, don't you? Yes. He slept. I don't know about you. Sleep is one of those things can be so interrupted for me if I just let my mind wander. Amen? Does it, are anybody else like that? Boy, I'm like that. I get to thinking about some stupid thing I did six months ago, and it'll interrupt my sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden my mind starts thinking, I wonder why I woke up. I wonder if it's because, uh, did I pay that bill? I wonder if I took care of that person. Did I call that person I was supposed to call? I mean, my mind just starts running from place to place, and it won't settle down. I tell you, Peter, I mean, he wasn't even in his own bed. Amen. I'm sure this was not a comfortable place to sleep. And yet he slept, knowing that he was facing death. Man, I admire Peter's faith to just cast all your care upon Jesus, for he cared for you. <clears throat> you got to love it. Well, it says the same night Peter was sleeping. Where was he? Between the two soldiers. Bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. There's your quadrarian, the four uh, soldiers. But Herod did not know was that God had more for Peter to do. Amen. He wasn't through with Peter. Verse 7. And behold... The angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. <laughs> and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up. I think Peter was sleeping mighty fine, don't you? I mean, first of all, the angel shows up and lights the room up. When I was in college, we had, uh, we had some uh, deaf students there. And uh, I'd never, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about, you know, being deaf or anything. I just never had been in touch or around anybody like that but come to find out in their dormitories they had installed lights that would come on as an alarm so that's the way they would wake up the light would come on and when the light came on they knew it was time to get up so it was like an alarm no alarm for peter it wouldn't have worked for peter the light of the light of an angel fills the room and peter's i mean he just saw in logs you know and he's laying on his side. I can hear, see him laying on his side, all curled up. I don't know if he's got a shirt or something stuck under his head. But he's just sound asleep. And the angel realized, well, that didn't work. So the angel goes over and slaps him on his side. Hey, Peter, get up. I think that's exactly what he said. So he raised him up, saying, arise up quickly. Get up. Peter, get up. My goodness. Peter, blurry-eyed. Huh? What? Who is it? What's, what's going on? Is it time to die? You know, he's just blurry-eyed. Arise up quick. You know, it's almost like 
You moms, amen. Getting your kids out of bed for school. You know, we had one, bless her heart, she just couldn't get up. It didn't matter what we did. Ruby, when she was little, Ruby dressed her, had her completely dressed and ready, hair done and everything. She's never woke up. You know, we pick her up and we carry her out the door, put her in the car and sit her up. And by the time we get to school, she's about half awake. You know, that's the way it was. When she got to be a teenager, <laughs> she'd get up and say she's going to take a shower, right? She'd sneak her pillow into the bathroom, turn the water on, and she'd lay down on the floor and sleep. <laughs> you did that? I did that. Joni said she did that. So this is what Peter, I mean, Peter, this is what this is what this angel's doing. He's wake up, shakes him, hits him on the side, get up, raises him up. Peter, get up. It's time to get up. Let's get going. And so this is what happens. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Cast thy garments about thee and follow me. And he went out, followed the angel, followed him, and wist not that it was true. I'm telling you, this guy was in a deep sleep. Yeah. I mean, he still kind of figured out, is this, is this real or not? Am I dreaming this? Am I asleep? Well, I wonder what this is. Is this real? I mean, that's what he's thinking. And the angel's just giving him information. The chains have fallen off. The two guards are not moving. The guards by the door, they're just, they're oblivious to what's going on. I don't know if they're awake or asleep. Doesn't really matter. But God's going to march Peter right out through the prison door. He's not going to take him out the back way or under a, 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 a tunnel. He's going to take him right out through the front door. And uh, so he follows the angel. Uh, He'd been sleeping so soundly, he still wasn't sure where he was headed. Uh, he wished not that it was true, verse 9, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. So he's thinking, I'm, I'm having a dream. Something's going on. And when they passed the first and the second ward, they came under the iron gate that leads under the city which opened to them of his own accord. Now, guys, let me tell you something. Every time I read that, I got to tell you, I have to think about the first time I saw a door that opened. You know, when they first came out, some of you aren't that old, but when they first came out, they had these pads, you know, and you'd go up there and step on the pad and the door would open, right? And as a little kid, I'd stand there and watch it open. Look at that. And it closed. I'd step on the pad again and it opened, right? Every time I read this, I go back to remembering that, thinking, isn't that amazing how that door just opens? When I walk up, it just opens. Now, Peter hadn't seen any of those kind of doors. So you can imagine when he saw that, he had to stop and go, wow, that's cool. They need to invent that sometime, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but the door, you know, everything, uh, God just, I mean, they walked through this prison, you know, there were prisoners there, there were guards there, two wards they went through, and then finally the gate, and no one stops them. Oh, so what happens? Peter, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. <laughs> this is the way Brother Newton's brain works. There's one street, and then there's a two street. We call them first street and second street, right? No, that's not, that's, that's not what that's doing. That's not the name of the street. You see, it's not capitalized, so it couldn't be the name of the street. I know I am. And they went out and passed on through one street, which is probably the street right there by the prison, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Why? He's safe now. I got him out of the prison. The angel's through. The work has been done. Peter's on the outside. And so there's no other instruction. As far as we know, the Bible doesn't tell us about anything. Verse 11, and when Peter was come to himself, hello, he's waking up. Maybe he's pinched himself. Maybe he's realizing, I'm not sleeping. He said, now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from this expectation of the people of the Jews. I put out here an aha moment. I want to go, duh. You know? Yeah. 
That's exactly, you finally figured that out, Peter, that's good. You finally woke up, you finally got your senses about you, you recognize that you've been set free, and God has been involved in that because he sent the angel and delivered him out of the hand of Herod. Praise God, he's not going to have to go through that death because it's, it says, and from all the expectation, what was the expectation of the people? That they were going to kill him, that he was going to die. He said, out of the expectation of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John. Peter, James, and John. James has been killed. Peter was going to be executed. And where does he go? He goes to John's house. Those three, they hung out together a lot. And he goes right to Mary's, the mother of John. She's the sister of Barnabas. And uh, John, I'm sorry, that's not John. That's not the John we're talking about. That's John Mark. What am I thinking? Uh, this is John Mark, whose surname was Mark. And we were going to read about Mark later on in Acts. But uh, he's, uh, he's the nephew of Barnabas. Uh, where many were gathered. Of course, this is the house where they were gathered to pray. It was a large house and probably was the place where the church met there in her house. The sister of Barnabas married the mother of John Mark. And they were there together praying. And then when you know, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate. Probably not real loud. Probably a soft knock, don't you imagine? Kind of looking to make sure nobody was coming. A damsel, that's a young lady, comes to hearken. That means comes to listen. Named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice. Now that, that speaks volumes to me. I, this is cool. Rhoda knew Peter's voice. That's familiarity. When you can recognize somebody's voice. Somebody calls you on the phone and they start talking. And you know immediately who it is, right? I mean, when Michelle Gensel calls me. I don't have any doubt in the world who that is. It's Michelle. You know, I don't need to have uh, the caller ID or nothing. I know it's Michelle, right? When Jim Parrish calls me. Right. Oh my goodness, brother Jim. I know exactly who it is, right? Brother Chimane can call me. He's got a distinct voice. I know that voice, you know. Uh, so, you, you know, you're familiar. And Rhoda, a young lady, was familiar with Peter's voice. And you know, I just have to say this. I think that's really neat that a young lady, a part of the church, knew the preacher's voice. She'd heard it many times. Maybe as he taught, maybe as he preached, maybe as he came and visited, but he knew, she knew his voice. And so what did she do? Well, we know the story, right? She, uh, and when she knew it was Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. I like that. She opened not the gate for gladness. Gate for gladness. Uh, she got so excited, the gladness there. She got so excited that Peter, they've been in there praying for Peter to get released. And all of a sudden she's at the door and she's, who is it? It's Peter. Let me in. That's Peter. That's, that's, whoa, that's Peter. Look at that. What if she takes off running to go tell everybody else, right? Peter stands up. Rhoda, Rhoda, are you still there? Rhoda, hello, anybody there? What happened? I, can you see his face? It's like, what in the world has happened? He, she ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Remember, what were they praying for? Peter to be released, right? And they said to her, Thou art mad. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Who are they? What are they? They're praying for Peter's release. She comes and says, Peter's at the door. That would have been an instant note that God had answered their prayer. And how do they respond? It couldn't happen. Now, let me tell you something. Before we say too much about them, how many times does God answer our prayer? We go, no, oh, that couldn't happen. Yeah. yeah. What in the world? You know. Isn't that a quinky dink? Amen. It's not a quinky dink. It's God working. Amen. And so we see here, they, they question her. They think she's gone mad. She's having her own little party or something. Something's gone wrong. But she, can, she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. 
it's not it's not Peter it's his angel it's somebody that looks like maybe an angel is, you know we've just been praying so hard your mind has got in the head that he's coming but Peter continued knocking at the door he's out there hey Rhoda somebody what happened come let me in knocking and when they had opened the door they saw him and they were astonished again what were they praying for for Peter's release there he is I can't believe that's you what are you doing here I can't believe this weren't you praying that God really maybe I've gone the wrong house maybe I've gone the wrong prayer meeting you know no this is where you're supposed to go and when they'd over there, they saw him and they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Now, don't you know that was an interesting story? You know, isn't it great when testimonies just kind of enthrall us? When the testimony is so wonderful, you sit there and your tears come up and you go, ah, man, isn't God good? Can you imagine Peter talking about, man, I was asleep and the angel come in and man, he was hitting me and he raised me up and he told me to get dressed. I wasn't sure if it was even an angel or not. We walked, the chains fell off my arms and what? Chains just fell off, really? And walked right out the door, the gate. When I got to the gate, the gate opened all by itself. Nobody had to open it, what? Man, they, I could just hear them, you know, the testimonies. The testimonies of God always are exciting. And this was certainly one of those testimonies. Uh, and he said, go show these things unto James. Now, this is not the James they killed. Amen. This is the other James. This is the James, the half brother of Jesus, who is the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. And uh, this is James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now, let me just say this right here. At that moment, we lose Peter. At that moment, we lose Peter. He went in another place. I don't think he disappeared. It's just that he, he, from that point, we don't know if he went to see James. We don't, but he left town. The, the story now changes because now we're going to learn about Paul. But notice this. We've got to go back to the prison and see what happened. It says, now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers. You understand what that means? That means there was a big stir among the soldiers. Because somebody's going to take the blame for this. What has become of Peter? And when Herod had sought for him, he found him not, examined the keepers, and commanded that they should be put to death. He court-martialed them. That was the rule. If you were a Roman soldier and you were put in charge of guarding a prisoner and you let them escape, then you would be executed. So they were intent upon trying to make sure that was kept and he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. That's King Herod. King Herod went down from Judea to Caesarea. He had a home there. And there's where he abode. Probably several months passed between verse 19 and 20. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. We don't know why. The Bible doesn't say. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop at verse 19. We're going to stop there because we're getting another whole story. We're going to move to talking about Paul and Silas again, or Paul and Barnabas. Or, yeah, Paul and Barnabas. And uh, so let's... Let's stop there and we'll pick up that story there. Herod having gone to Caesarea, there he is. And now he's uh, on vacation. And um, that destroying the church sometimes takes all the energy out of the evidently. And he needed a vacation from it. So he goes to Caesarea to vacation. All right, we'll stop there. Any question, comment, or thought? That's a great story, isn't it? I just love these stories. I love the, I, you know, we're reading about the, the beginning of the church and we're seeing how the God is, is spreading it out and sending them out from Judea to Samaria to the most parts of the world. 
And we're seeing that, and in the middle of that, we're getting these great stories, great testimonies of how God was involved in these men's lives as they led and as they, 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 were, they were instrumental in the beginning of the church. And um, I, it's exciting to me. I just love reading these stories. I just think it's awesome. And to see God do those things. Listen, the same God of Peter, the same God you serve, you know that, don't you? That's why we need to pray right. The same God of those people that were praying for Peter, the same God we serve and pray to tonight. And he can't answer our prayers. If there's anything we need to learn tonight, we need to learn to be prayer warriors. Pray for people. All right. Well, let's stand and be in word of prayer. We'll pray and then we'll be dismissed. Don't forget, we'll meet back here Sunday uh, for church at 830. And then uh, Sunday school, 945. And then 11 o'clock service. And so I hope that you'll be here. We're going to continue in Romans chapter 8. And uh, I, great passage of scripture. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you, Lord, for all the many things that you brought to our attention tonight through the word of God. The greatest of all, Father, the one that's most convicting to me is that of prayer, Lord. I don't pray enough. I don't pray like I should. Lord, I pray you'd forgive me. I pray, Lord, that we as a church would understand the importance of corporate prayer as we saw tonight in the scriptures, how they came together to pray together and how as corporately we can pray and Lord, we can expect to see you do the great things that only you can do. We love you. Let us be a praying church. We love you. Go with us now as we finish out this week and we look forward to meeting again this weekend. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.